Hello, good evening. Welcome again to our Bible study. We're continuing to work our way through the book of James. If you could open your Bibles and turn with me to James. We're in chapter 5. We have uh, one more after this one. Um, so we're in James in chapter 5. We'll be reading verses 7 to 12. Be patient, therefore, brothers, until the coming of the Lord. See how the farmer waits for the precious fruit of the earth, being patient about it, until it receives the early and the late rains. You also be patient, establish your hearts, for the coming of the Lord is at hand. Do not grumble against one another, brothers, so that you may not be judged. Behold, the judge is standing at the door, as an example of suffering and patience, brothers. Take the prophets who spoke in the name of the Lord. Behold, we consider those blessed who remained steadfast. You have heard of the steadfastness of Job, and you have seen the purpose of the Lord, how the Lord is compassionate and merciful. But above all, my brothers, do not swear, either by heaven or by earth or by any other oath, but let your yes be yes and your no be no, so that you may not fall under condemnation. Now, James is concerned clearly for believers to be patient. If you just notice how many times he said brothers in the passage he's talking to believers he's talking to believers who are facing trials and is concerned to set before christians the proper attitude and frame of mind that we must have if we're going to persevere until the end he's concerned that we have the right focus in our lives if we're able to respond to suffering and to the trials of life in a an appropriately christian way James knows that the Christian life is a long journey and that growth in the Christian life is a process. And in order to benefit from that process of growth, uh, to prosper, to be able to rejoice in times of trial, we need to have the right, the proper focal point in our lives, for our lives. So the first point from our passage, as James 5, 7 to 12, is that believers persevere under trial waiting the return of the Lord. In verses 7 and 8, James calls us to live waiting patiently for the return of Christ, even under duress and suffering. Believers are to be prepared to wait patiently for the Lord's coming, even in the midst of trials. Be patient, therefore, brothers, until the coming of the Lord. The Christian life is a marathon, not a sprint. The finish line is the second coming. Not even at death. But nothing less than the second coming is the finish line, is the goal, is the focus that the believer, that the Christian is looking forward to. In verse 7, James delivers the first of six imperatives in our verses today. Four of them are positive, two are negative. Okay, in verse 7, be patient. In verse 8, be patient. The same one, but he gives it, gives it again, so I'm counting it twice. The third one, establish your hearts. In verse 9, do not grumble against one another is the fourth and the first negative. The second negative is in verse 12, but above all, brothers, do not swear. And the sixth directive is in verse 12 also, but let you... Your, your yes be yes and your no be no. So there are six imperatives, six directives that James gives us in this passage. But in verse 7, it is to be patient. Now, patience. This isn't a rebuke against impatient husbands. It's not a rebuke against impatient wives. It's not a rebuke against impatient mums and dads. It's not a rebuke against impatient children. There may be a need to rebuke impatient husbands or wives or children or parents, or to rebuke people who don't know how to cue today. No, James is talking about living a life that is looking forward to one event. Be patient for that. And that event is not the achievement of your success. It is not even death. It is not the believer desiring to cross the finish line of death and to have one soul's soul ushered immediately into the presence of God while your body rests in the ground united to Christ until the day of resurrection. No, the day that the believer is patient 
for. The day that the believer is looking forward to is the day of the coming of Christ. And James says we need to live today in light of then. It is the coming of Christ for which we're waiting. And all of life is to be lived in light of that day. The coming of Christ is mentioned 300 times or so in the New Testament, which means for the mathematicians among us that the coming of Christ, there is a mention of the coming of Christ one time for every 13 verses, Matthew to Revelation. I think God has a point in that, that James is drawing out and saying that is the goal for which we are aiming. That is the focal point of life. And James, James is saying that we need to cultivate a mindset for the long haul and we need to be patiently waiting for that day for the great event the coming of our Lord Jesus the believer the Christian life is therefore as one author so wonderfully said a long obedience in the same direction the direction the goal the purpose the aim is the coming of Christ and we're to be faithful and patient for that day these believers were going to face trials they were in the midst of trials already we've been looking at that we've seen that we've applied it to our own lives we've applied it to our own setting so james was encouraging them and encouraging us to endure james gives quite a ordinary illustration of the point the farmer he speaks of the early and later rains and in palestine the early rains softened up the ground so you could plant and the Later rains made the harvest plentiful and fruitful and the farmer was dependent upon the yield that he would get from the Lord providing those rain, that that rain. And all he could do was do his part and then wait patiently for the Lord to bring the rain at the right time, in the right place, the right amount. And just like the farmer waits on the appropriate weather for planting, harvesting and is dependent on the Lord, So no matter how he works on these events, so we must also wait patiently. We should endure patiently by cultivating a fixed heart. Verse 8, you also be patient, establish your hearts for the coming of the Lord is at heart and is at hand. Fix our hearts, establish your hearts, a determination, a resolution, a perseverance, a a persistence in striving for the goal, in striving a stickability. He uses the same verb that is found in Luke 9.51. Luke 9.51 says, When the days drew near for Jesus to be taken up, Jesus set his face to go to Jerusalem. And that's the same word that James is using, that we are to set our face, we're to set our heart resolutely to establish your heart. Establish your heart on the coming of Jesus, just like Jesus fixed his eye on the cross. My friend, the whole of life is to be lived in light of the Lord's coming. In patient resolve for that day, we may drift into sin, but nobody drifts into holiness. Holiness is grown into, but it's cultivated by patience, by the purpose of God. So in this passage, James is orienting orienting us to be prepared for the long haul, to be prepared for suffering, to be prepared for trials, to be aimed like an arrow at the coming of the Lord. Paul speaks about fighting the faith, which is an appropriate metaphor to draw on. The Duke of Wellington, who fought those campaigns against Napoleon during the Napoleonic Wars in the early 19th century, if you remember his Peninsula campaigns and the most famous was the Battle of Waterloo and Wellington's most famous victory was a victory in which his battle plan was his strategy was essentially this get pounded all day and wait for the Prussians that was the battle plan of Waterloo Wellington had an inexperienced army he only had very few veterans he didn't want to attack he couldn't attack Napoleon because Napoleon had all the he had the resources and was one of the the greatest strategic generals in the history of western warfare so wellington determined that his army needed to stick it out needed to stand wait till the prussians got there and hold on until the prussians could might mount their offensive against napoleon so he was pounded all day as he waited for the prussians to get there they got there and they won 
The only ballot battle in the history of military warfare in the 19th century that was lost at five o'clock and won at seven o'clock by the same side. The battle was over. Napoleon had won at five. And the Prussians arrived at five and at seven o'clock it was a rout. There was a point where the armies of Wellington had to focus on and that point, that focus, that focus was the arrival of the Prussians. Probably not the greatest illustration of the world to say that the arrival of the Prussians is an illustration of the coming of Christ, but you get the point. The Christian life is the same way. You see, the premise of the great hymn, William W. Howe's hymn, for all the saints who from their labours rest, the saints who are above enjoying the presence of God right now. Then in his hymn, William Howe praises God for the martyrs, for the apostles, for the evangelists who've gone before and are now in heaven above. God was the one who caused them to persevere. God is the one who brought them to the throne above. Howe's hymn goes on, Thou wast the, that thou wast their rock, their fortress and their might. Thou, Lord, their captain in the well-fought fight. Thou in the darkness drear, their one true light. Alleluia, alleluia. He speaks of the glorious reality that God was their hope in the dark days. Then the hymn writer turns the focus of prayer upon us. O oh, may thy soldiers, faithful, true and bold, fight as the saints who nobly fought of old. And win with them the victor's cry of gold. Alleluia. Alleluia. He's praying that the Lord would enable us to fight as the saints who've gone before. And when the strife is fierce, the warfare long steals on the ear the distant triumph song. And hearts are brave again and arms are strong. Alleluia. Alleluia. When you're beginning to fail... You hear in the distant future the triumph song. The victory is already won in Christ. And what you need is to get a glimpse of that victory that is already won, that is certain. And then you can put one foot in front of the other and survive the suffering and the trials that we endure right now. The hymn writer goes on. The golden evening brightens in the west. Soon, soon to faithful warriors comes the rest. Sweet is the calm of paradise the blessed. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. He's talking about the day when the sunset of God sets on a believer. The believer's soul is laid in the ground and his soul goes to, be pa to, in, goes to paradise. But even that is not the focus of the ultimate hope because there's two more stanzas in William Howe's hymn. It isn't a faithful death that the believer aims for. But lo, there breaks a yet more glorious day. The tr saints triumphant tis in bright array. The king of glory passes on his way. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. From earth's wide bounds, from ocean's farthest coast. Through gates of pearls streams in the countless host. And singing to the Father, Son and Holy Ghost. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. You see, there are points in my life when I've been discouraged in ministry. When I'm discouraged in my own, with my own sin. When I wonder, why am I doing this? And I remind myself there'll be a day when I stand with my fellow ministers and brothers and sisters and we will see the King of Glory passing on his way. And we'll turn to one another and say, this is why we did it. This is why we preach. This is why we pray. This is what we were hoping for. We were hoping for the day when we would see the King of Glory passing on his way and we can endure anything, absolutely anything, if that is our hope. Fix your eyes, brothers and sisters, on the coming of the Lord Jesus, the King of Glory passing on his way. And then in the midst of trials that God will surely bring your way, you will be able to stand. Second point. Evidence of struggle with patience in verses 9 to 12. James talks about two symptoms that will show that we're struggling with this patience and endurance. In verse 9 to 11, he speaks about complaining and grumbling and criticising against our brothers and sisters. He says, do not grumble, do not recriminate against, do not criticise, don't blame the brethren in the midst of your trials. That isn't showing the 
Christian patience that he's been talking about in verses 7 and 8. If we're grumbling against the brethren. Are you a grumbler? Or are you someone who builds up? It's not surprising that one grand, grand temptation in trial is to pick on others. You're going through a hard time. You don't like what's happening. You maybe you don't like the atmosphere or whatever it is. You look for somebody else to blame. So, so often the people we target are our brothers and sisters in Christ. We blame them somehow for all, all that's going on around me. And we point out their deficiencies. Oh, the minister, he was terrible. He didn't minister to me in the way that we wanted him to minister to us in the midst of this trial. They didn't do this. They didn't do that. James says, don't do it because Christ is coming. Don't let the judge walk through the door when you're criticizing a brother and sister on, in Christ. Instead of destructive speech, which disrupts and breaks the fellowship of God, he says in verses 10 and 11, consider the prophets in Job. They endured suffering. And with the speech, what did they do? They edified the brethren. Do you edify or do you grumble? And we learn three things from this this reference to Job if you look at verse 10 we learn we ought to ex expect to experience suffering which requires patience verse 10 as an example of suffering and patience brothers take the prophets who spoke in the name of the Lord James is saying that this is the norm for the Christian life we should expect the kind of trials that call for endurance which demand patience think of this if Daniel hadn't been exiled and deported, we wouldn't have heard of him. If Daniel hadn't been thrown into a lion's den, we wouldn't have heard of him. He went through trials which required endurance and he encourages us. And then James says that there is blessing and happiness in the exercise of patience and endurance. Verse 11, behold, we consider those blessed who remain steadfast. God blesses those who patiently, faithfully endure. There is a blessing in enduring during trial. We see the character it produces. We long to have the character that is produced, the blessing which results from trials and endurance. And thirdly, there is a purpose in trials that demand endurance and patience. Look what he says in verse 11. You have heard of the steadfastness of Job and you've seen the purpose of the Lord, how the Lord is compassionate and merciful. The end of Job, Job 42 verse 5, I had heard of you by the hearing of the ear, but now my eye sees you. God had revealed himself in an extraordinary way. But notice that the outcome of this endurance isn't simply character building, but it is the sight of the living God in his mercy and compassion. Job didn't just come through his trial with more character, with refined character. He came through his experience with more experience of God. He knew God in a way that he would not have known him otherwise. He knew God in a way at the end of his experience that he didn't know at the beginning. Look at the prophets, look at Job, and you learn this about trials. So instead of criticising the brethren, complaining, blaming someone else for your for the way you feel today, instead of recriminating against the brethren in the midst of your trials, remember the prophets in Job and realise that even trials, God intends for your good. God intends for the blessing of his people. Verse 12, above all, my brothers, do not swear either by heaven or by earth or by any other oath. But let your yes be yes and your no be no, so that you may not fall under condemnation. <laughs> I wondered this, you know, why would you know, suddenly James almost like break the flow, if you like. Oh, stop. Boom. But above all, my brothers, do not swear. Well, you know, in James's day and in Jesus's day, there was a tendency to use oaths to get around the commitment rather than to reinforce it. So James, like the Lord before him, is attacking that kind of usage of oaths. James is talking about living the Christian life with a focus on the coming of Jesus. What does oath taking and um, speech like this have to do, do, with, do with this? Because in the Christian life, brothers and sisters, patience is not manifested by grand verbose speech or grand verbal promises, but by quiet talk which follows through.
Our patient endurance will be shown not in not in the grand grandiosity of our verbal commitments, our flowing words, but in our in our endurance under trial. Some of us are going through trials today. Some of you on a regular basis wake up in the morning and it is a challenge to put one foot in front of the other and carry on. And I can't imagine, I really can't imagine a more comforting and challenging and strengthening and applicable word than the word that James is speaking to us today under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. That we may be patient, brothers and sisters, that we may be patient and wait for the coming of the Lord. May the Lord bless this word for his, for his glory and for our eternal goods. God bless.